you know, it's a wonderful privilege for us to be here together once again. Um, this evening, as we delve into God's Word, we have been concentrating on the book of Daniel and Revelation, but at the same time, we have been skipping all over the Bible. Uh, you know, the Bible is a place where it is safe to skip from here to there. We always get in trouble when we jump outside of the Bible. But once we are staying within the realms of Scripture, we know that we are staying within the boundary of truth. Uh, but our concentration during this shocking Bible prophecy uh, series is uh, are the books of Daniel and Revelation. And this evening, our subject is your ticket to space. <laughs> your ticket to space. And so this evening, I pray that you have come and you are ready with an open mind to delve into God's word as we seek divine understanding. Um, to get our questions answered so that we may continue to seek God while he may be found. But as usual, before we go into God's word, let us bow our heads and pray. Our loving Father and our God, precious are the truths that you have revealed in your words to us. Be with us this evening in a special way as we open your word one more time that you may give us the wisdom that we need to be obedient to these words we ask. In Jesus' name, amen and uh, amen. You know, your, our topic for this evening, your ticket to space. Uh, just getting my pointer. Your ticket um, to space. You know, I'm sure that you have seen in the news, uh, especially um, how um, the a flight was taken, a commercial flight, a commercial space flight uh, was taken by Sir Richard Branson, who is basically a VI lander, a VVI lander, and. Um, um, he was in the local news as well as he was in the international news because he who are getting involved in space flight and people, ordinary people, are wanting to become astronauts. And so Richard Branson, um, Virgin Galactic, is planning to sell tickets starting at $450,000 so that you can fly in space for maybe a couple minutes and get back down and at least like Richard, earn your astronaut pin just to say that you have escaped or almost escaped Earth's atmosphere and you can now include yourself in that elite group of astronauts and so uh, even as I peruse on YouTube, every now and again there is an advertisement that comes up where Richard Branson is having a sweepstake. And the prize is you can, you will be have, if you win that, those two tickets, you'll be able, along with your, maybe your loved one, to take a trip to space in the Virgin Galactic. My dear friends, of course, you know that for many years now, uh, the United States of America, along with other countries, have been venturing out to space. And who can forget, who can forget the strange launch of Columbia, where oftentimes the attraction is to see that rocket takes off. And even though I've been, I, I was living in Florida for many years, I've never driven to, um, to, 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 to the launching site, uh, whereas people come from all over the country. But I could stay in my yard in South, Africa, in South um, Florida, rather, and I'll be able to look in the distance and I'll be able to see the launch take off. But there was a launch of Columbia shuttle that caught our attention because what really got us was not the leaving, but it was the re-entering of the atmosphere when seven of our brightest and our best lives were not out in a moment upon re-entry. 
the aircraft burst into flame and broke up and all lives aboard were ended. My dear friends, tonight, I want to talk about a space journey that will not end in disaster. A journey that will not only begin well, but it will end well. Dear friends, I want to be a part of this journey. What about you? And our commander is not going to be the best pilot that NASA has, but our commander is going to be Jesus Christ himself. And I can tell you, he will get us home. Pass our nearest neighbor, the moon. Huh? Pass the sun. Pass 93 million miles from the Earth. Pass the planet Mercury and Jupiter and Saturn. We will be able to go higher and higher and still higher. Passing the nebulae and all through open space in Orion. Oh, he is taking us home. And there is one thing to be certain is that this space journey will not end in disaster. The second coming of Jesus Christ will accomplish what no other scientist yet has dreamed possible. Our Lord will deliver us from the clutches of death. Oh, the story of this remarkable last day space journey is found throughout the Bible. God's end time plan is revealed in his word. And so the book of Revelation, the mountain peak throughout its prophecies is the second coming of Jesus Christ. The climax of the book of Revelation is the second coming of Jesus Christ. So when you look at the book of Revelation, there is one central theme. And that central theme of Revelation is Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is not a dragon. It is not the beast with seven heads. The great prophecies of the book of Revelation do not focus on a beast, but it focuses on Jesus Christ. These prophecies describe the return of our Lord and the climax of history. Now I want you this evening to notice the pattern. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 40, it says, Then I look, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. When the book of Revelation pictures the second coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus is pictured as having a sharp sickle in his hand, and also a crown of gold upon his head, not a crown of thorns this time, because this time he is coming in power and great glory. He's coming as king of kings and lord of lords. The Bible does not picture Jesus coming silently or secretly. He came silently once as a baby in Bethlehem's manger. Very few knew that he was coming. When the Bible describes him coming in the book of Revelation, the picture, though, is not the same as when he came the first time. Oh, no. This time he's going to come with a golden crown upon his head. He's going to come with a sharp sickle in his hand to reap the harvest of the earth. Oh, the Bible always pictures Christ coming in power and great glory. When you look at the book of Revelation, it always pictures Jesus as coming in majesty. Revelation 19 and verse 11, by one word it says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses as well. A white horse, you see, my dear friends, is a symbol of purity, is a symbol of victory, and it is a symbol of is a symbol of triumph when Jesus Christ comes the second time with a gold crown upon his head, riding a white horse. He is pictured as coming as a victorious general. He is pictured as coming to defeat all of the forces of evil. Christ comes to vanquish the enemy. 
he comes as kings of kings and lord of lords. The book of Revelation is very plain, very plain that Jesus comes to reap the harvest of the earth, that Jesus comes as leading the armies of heaven, that Jesus comes as king of kings. The book of Revelation does not know about a secret rapture of Christ. Jesus returns victoriously. Jesus returns gloriously. The book of Revelation knows nothing about a secret rapture. Revelation 11 and verse 15 tells us, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. When Jesus comes, the great controversy will end. Sin and sinners will be no more. Jesus coming is not some mysterious event. Oh no, he comes to reign over the powers of over the entire universe. He comes to be worshipped. He comes to be praised. He comes, my dear friends, for his redeemed to reign forever and ever. Dear friends, have you ever wondered how, how, how can I know that I will be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ? How can I know that when he comes, I will be caught up to meet him in the air and live with him for eternity in his eternal kingdom? The Bible makes it very plain, my dear friends, this evening, that there's two things about Jesus' return. First, the Bible is clear about how he will come the second time. And the Bible is also very clear and makes it abundantly plain how we can be ready for his coming. You see, God is not some mystic guessing about the future. We do not, we, we do not need to guess regarding the events surrounding Jesus' return. Oh no, not at all. Dear friends, Jesus does not guess. He knows. He knows the end from the beginning. Dear friends, the Bible prophecy does not guess. Bible prophecy, no. Dear friends, the second coming is not vague. It is very specific. The second coming is not like some unidentified life object that is coming to take snatch people from this world. Jesus is not going to come in some flying saucer from outer space. That is not how Christ will come. Oh no, the coming of the Messiah will not rise up as an earthly charismatic leader. Oh no, he's not coming up. He's coming down because he's coming from above. It is not necessary to find out from God's word. It's necessary rather to find out from God's word just how Jesus will come. You know, God's end time plan is revealed in his word, the Bible. And this has been my textbook out here. Dear friends, night after night, I have been pointing you to God's word because I believe that this is a source of truth. This is God's word. And I've proven to you what God says will happen. Will happen. The Bible is very plain. Jesus describes one of the deceptions before his return in this way. Now listen carefully. Luke 17 and verse 23 says, Men will tell you, here he is, or here he is. Do not go running after them. In other words, then, if, if anybody says, guess what? Jesus has come secretly in this particular part of the country, and you need to go and see him. You know that they are deceivers. If someone tells you that Jesus has appeared in Ethiopia, you know that there is something wrong with that picture. Because Jesus says that men will tell you, here he is, or here he is. Do not go get a plane ticket to go to Ethiopia to see the Messiah. Because the Bible tells us that when he comes, that every eye shall see him. Some man may say, you know, I heard he's in Chicago. Or maybe he's in New York. Someone might say, oh no, he's in Orlando, Florida. Oh no, maybe he's in Los Angeles, California. The Bible says, do not go running. Luke 17 and verse 24 says, why? For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky. 
from one end to the other. Christ coming would be a sudden appearance, just as a flash of lightning across the sky. He would not appear on some talk show in New York City. Oh no, my dear friends, Jesus coming would be spectacular. It would be magnificent. He won't rise up from somewhere. He's coming down from up there. He'll be coming down, my dear friends. He won't walk down some major street in the world. He won't hold up his hands and say, I am the Messiah. Oh no, his coming is like lightning which flashes and lights up the sky. Oh, my dear friends, this evening, Christ is coming down from above. He won't rise up from below. Christ is coming with glory. But somebody says, is it really necessary to understand all of this? I mean, if I just love Jesus, what does it matter what I believe? Isn't that enough? You know, a young couple, they moved into the city of Toronto. Just bought a new house. And as they moved in, they put their barbecue grill on the back patio. And when they went out shopping and came back home, their grill went missing. And so they realized, wow, we have just moved into this neighborhood. And I mean, we're just packing our stuff and our grill have gone missing. But guess what? By the next day, they got up. They realized that the grill was returned by whoever stole it. But not only was the barbecue grill returned, it also accompanied with two tickets and an apology for borrowing the grill without their permission. These two tickets were for a popular play that was playing in the theater in town. And so they said, at first we thought we were in the wrong neighborhood, but now we realize we are in a kind neighborhood. So they went out that evening to enjoy the theater. And by the time they came back home, their house was empty. It means therefore then that those barbecue hustlers, the barbecue grill hustlers had given them the ticket as an enticement to get them away so that they can steal everything that they own. My dear friend, I want to let you know, it matters what you believe. It matters what you believe. What you believe has consequences. Satan will attempt the same way in order to deceive men and women. And many are going to be deceived. He is the great deceiver. He counterfeits the truth in order to lead millions away from Jesus. But Jesus clearly reveals his plan. And if we want to know the truth and we want to know God's plan, we don't have to worry. We don't have to wonder because, my dear friend, God's plan is revealed in his word. God's plan is in his word. There are some clear facts in God's word about his second coming. My dear friends, this evening I want us to realize that Christ's coming will be a literal event. Not figurative. Huh? Not having peace and prosperity on this earth and a, a, a warm feeling on the inside. No. Jesus coming is going to be a literal coming. You ask, how do I know that? Well, the Bible tells me so. Acts 1 and verse 11. From the mouth of Jesus himself, when he was there on the Mount of Olives, defying gravity, levitating, moving back up to heaven. Yet when Jesus looked into the eyes of his disciples and declared unto them that this same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, what would happen? It says that what? He will come in like manner. My dear friends, what does that mean? It means that a real Jesus went up and a real Jesus will come back down. My dear friends, a real Jesus that the disciples could see went up and a real Jesus that you and I will be able to see will come back down. Jesus ascends in power. Jesus ascends, the Bible says, this same Jesus, will descend. Dear friend, who this Jesus is, they are talking about the same Jesus that opened the eyes of the blind, the same Jesus that raised the dead, the same Jesus, my dear friends, that 
unblocked that the deaf ear, that same Jesus, my dear friend, who healed the sick, this same Jesus will return someday. My dear friends, Christ coming will be a visible event. Visible event. God says that the coming of Jesus Christ will be a visible event. His ascension was visible. His disciples saw him as he was leaving. We are going to see him when he is when he is descending. The book of Revelation says in Revelation 1 and verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, clouds of angels, and every eye will see him. My dear friend, there is hardly another scripture in the Bible that is as plain as this one. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye shall see him. How many people will see him? Everyone would see him. Who will see him? Every eye will see him. Is Jesus coming secretly just to a chosen few? No. The Bible says that when Christ comes, it's going to be a literal event. The same Jesus that went up is going to be the same Jesus that comes down. And the Bible says that every eye shall see him. My dear friends, this can, if every eye is going to see him, this can only mean that those persons who are alive on the earth at the time, either everyone would have their sight, or it would mean that even blind people would see Jesus coming. His glory is going to be so bright that even the blind would be able to see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. My dear friends, I want to let you know as well that Jesus Christ's second coming also will be an audible event, meaning that you'll be able to hear it the same way in which the thunder follows the lightning most of the time. Once that lightning is close to you and it strikes across the sky, the next thing you hear is the thunder. The same way as well, when Jesus Christ returns, not only will you see him like the lightning, but you hear him like the thunder. How do you know that? The Bible tells me so. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16. Paul writing to the Thessalonian believers so said. Again, look at the expression again. The Lord himself almost sounds like this same Jesus. Huh? It is saying, not someone else. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And this trumpet is going to be so loud that it will literally raise the dead. And it says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. My dear friends, this evening, here is good news. Jesus Christ is coming literally. He's a real Christ that comes. Jesus Christ is going to become visible. My dear friends, every eye will be able to see him. And Jesus Christ will return audibly. Every ear will be able to hear him. Have you lost a loved one by death? Maybe a little baby that you have to bless in the grave. My dear friends, maybe you have lost a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife or a mother or a father. The Bible says, my dear friends, that when Jesus Christ comes, he will descend with a shout. And the Bible says that our loved ones will rise from their dusty bed. And they'll be able to greet them and meet them once again. My dear friends, it says with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, it's going to be a trumpet of victory. It's going to be a trumpet of triumph. It's going to be a trumpet signifying conquest over death. Bible says, huh? and the dead in Christ will rise first. My dear friends, if that is not good news, I don't know what it is. One day Jesus will say, John, come forth. Mary, come forth. Peter, come forth. Agnes, come forth. Joseph, come forth. Jesus will call our name and call us out of the grave the same way in which he called Lazarus to come forth. My dear friends, the loved ones will come out of the tomb and they are going to be caught up, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Caught up in immortal glory. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air. With whom? With them? With them. With whom? The righteous dead. Those who are resurrected. The righteous dead who have been sleeping in the graves. We will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You know, it reminds me of that old lady who said, you know, I've never ridden on an airplane, but thank God the day is coming when I'm going to ride on plane here. We're going to caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Let us notice the intimacy of those words. Notice that these words are saturated with love. Jesus wants to be with you. He wants to be with me. Oh, Jesus comes to live upon this earth at this time. No, we don't meet him on earth. We meet him in the air. We meet him in the air. That's why Matthew 24 verse 26 says, Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Because when Jesus Christ comes the second time, he would not even touch this sinful earth. We are going to meet him in the air. There's going to be a rendezvous in mid-air, perhaps higher than we are virgin galactic way, perhaps higher than we are so rich and bands and flu. We are going to meet him in the air, and we won't need a spacecraft. My dear friend, because we have new bodies, We'll have bodies that can move as swift as light, as swift as the angels. Yes, friends, I'm looking forward to that when I can fly, fly away from this place without a COVID test, without paying for a plane ticket, without catching a boat. My dear friends, I will be able to meet Jesus in the air. Bible says that Satan will masquerade as Christ, working mighty, mighty miracles. But look, Suppose someone says to you, guess what? Jesus is in Paris. Huh? Or he's in Palm Springs. Jesus says, do not go there. He is being, even if he's a dazzling brightness, don't go there. The Bible says, do not go. Do not go there. Because when the real Christ comes, he will come streaming down the corridor of the sky. My dear friends, tonight, Christ coming will be a glorious event. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 27 says, For as the lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Oh, God is going to perform a dazzling light show in the sky. He will stream down from the sky with 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 of angels heaven, my dear friends, will be empty. All the angels of heaven will ride on with King Jesus. Dear friends, he will cry out, Mary, come forth. Only Christ, the life giver, can do that. Only Christ, the life giver, can resurrect the dead. My dear friends, this real Christ is coming in the sky. Hallelujah. And the real Christ is going to resurrect the dead. The real Christ will, will, will catch us up in the sky to travel with him past the moon, past the sun, past the stars, to the throne room of the universe. And we will always be with the Lord. Oh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. The Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. Now put those two texts together. Revelation 1 and verse 7 that says, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. And you see, therefore, then, that it is not only believers who will see him when he comes, but what? When Christ comes the second time, every eye shall what? Every eye shall see him. There are only two classes of people. When Jesus Christ comes, there, are, there is the same. And there is the unsaved. There is the redeemed. And there is the lost. There is no second chance when Christ comes. When Christ comes, that's it. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. 
they will see. My dear friend, there is no such thing in the Bible anywhere such as a secret rapture. Nowhere. You do not read it in the Bible. Human beings made up, my dear friends, and they misinterpret some texts in the scripture. But the Bible is very clear that the second coming of Jesus is going to be the noisiest, most magnificent, most glorious event that this earth has ever seen. Nothing secret about it. The Bible says they will see. That is all the nations of the earth. The Son of Man coming with power and great glory. My dear, my dear friends, this evening, Jesus comes literally. The real person is going to come, not in spirit. The real flesh and blood that resurrected. The real Jesus that ate with his disciples. He will come. Dear friend, he's going to come visibly. Every eye shall see him. He's going to come audibly. Everyone will hear. The deaf would hear. The blind would see Jesus Christ coming. And Jesus is going to come gloriously. Dear friends, this evening, Christ coming will be a climatic event. The coming of Christ is the decisive event in human history. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 53 tells us, listen. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That is how the Bible refers to death as a sleep. But we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. Ah, uh, you know, um, they, they, they are using the quickest language, you know, as quick as you, 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 you blink your eye. Ah, uh, the, 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 the Paul is, is grabbing for words in our computer age. You would have said that in a nanosecond. Huh? But nanoseconds, that's not in Paul's language. So Paul says, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. My dear friends, Paul continues by saying, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. My dear friends, yesterday I went for a walk as I often do in order to get my exercise and going down those uneven hills. Today, I realized that my knee was hurting. But my dear friends, thank God that when Jesus Christ comes, we will be changed. No more arthritis. No more, no more high blood pressure. No more, it, our body, we'll get new bodies. New bodies, my dear friends. Dear friends, the Bible says we are going to be changed. For the perishable. Paul says, for the perishable must close itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Woo! Could you imagine? Can you imagine that when Christ comes streaking down the corridors of the sky, the earth would be illuminated with his glory, the ground would rumble, the buildings would shake. The lightning would flash and the thunder would crash and 10,000 times 10,000 of angels would spread all over the earth and get to the graves of the righteous believers and welcome them as they come forth in immortal youth and glory to greet them, never to live in a sinful environment anymore. Their bodies would no longer have the curse of sin. There will be no more deaf ears, no more blind eyes, no more arthritic limbs. There will be no diseased bodies. There will be no amputees, my dear friends. Hands would go back. Feet would go back, my dear friends. Ear would go back. Hallelujah. And my dear friends, I want to let you know, the Bible says that we are going to have new bodies. No more, no heart arthritis. No more heart disease. No more gallstone. And I, I, my dear friends, we are going to have new bodies. As believers, dear friends, we are looking for Christ's second coming. This is the most magnificent event in the heavens. Instantly, our bodies will be changed. No longer subject to disease and death. We are going to receive immortality. What a day that will be when Christ comes. What a day. Instantly, we are transformed. 
instantly we are changed. New life will pulsate through our body. My dear friends, our heart could beat with excitement to see the face of Jesus. Oh, my dear friends, we would sing his praises at all, as our bodies are changed from corruptible to incorruptible. Revelation 15 and verse 3 says, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and so are your ways, O King of saints. Oh, my dear friends, we are going to see the dead resurrected. We are going to see our brothers, our sisters. We are going to see our son and our daughter. We are going to see our husband and our wife as they come forth from the tomb with you and immortal bodies. Angels are going to present themselves to us again as we embrace our loved ones with tears flowing down our cheeks as we ascend to Jezah. Ascend to God's throne. You know, not long ago, a Christian pastor was on his way to a preaching assignment. And he got into an accident. He was a great man of God, but he did not survive. He died. You know what his wife said? You know, I can't wait to meet him again in the air. When he wakes up, he's going to ask me, but weren't we on our way to the church? And she said, I'm going to tell him, yes, we were. But you took a little nap. And now we are on our way to heaven. My dear friends, I want to let you know that death may interrupt the best of us. But as far as a Christian is concerned, death is just a little nap. So Jesus Christ is going to come to wake us up. To wake us up. Dear friends, you may have loved ones who have been taking a little nap. But I want to let you know that Jesus is going to wake them up as well. Dear friend, picture this scene. When loved ones on that day would embrace each other. When husbands and wives weeping with joy will meet each other. What a day that will be. And my dear friend, this is no fairy tale story. This is real. As real as the sun rose this morning. This is the greatest drama of all the ages. When we see our loved ones come out of the grave and we are singing, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, O King of saints. When we see Jesus Christ coming as King of kings and Lord of lords, we will cry out in Isaiah 25 and verse 9. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. Dear friends, we have waited for him. We have not accepted the false Christ. We have not accepted the counterfeit Christ. We have not accepted the false Messiah who pretended that he was Christ. No. We have waited for Jesus to come. Dear friends, he's going to say, this is the Lord. We have waited for him. And we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Oh, the Bible says that when Jesus comes, there are going to only be two classes of people on the earth. The saved and the lost. Those that look up and say, we have waited for him and he will save us. Then there are going to be those who will look up and see him and their hearts will fail them for fear. They are going to see him coming in the clouds of glory and they know they have not been living in harmony with his will. They have turned their backs on him. They have rejected the claims of his love. They have turned away from his mercy. And now they realize it's forever too late. My dear friends, his spirit had impressed them. Had impressed their hearts. But they said, no, Lord. They said, no. They have crowded out the things of eternity. They were just too busy for God. Too busy for Jesus. Too busy to get involved. With the things of one's life to have time for God. They have turned their backs on Jesus who wants to save them. And dear friend, when Jesus Christ comes the second time, there are only going to be two classes of people in this world. The same glory that would welcome the saints, that is the same glory that will consume the wicked. And dear friend, 
Revelation is very plain about it. Revelation 6, verses 15 to 17 says, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountain, and said to the mountain and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Why? For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? How tragic that will be. The Bible tells us that a day is going to come when men and women will pray to rocks. They had an opportunity to pray to Jesus. They had an opportunity to ask for the forgiveness of their sins. They had an opportunity to follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. But they refused and now they cannot face Jesus. They cannot bear his glory because they have held on to their sins when Jesus asked them to give it up. They held on to their sins until it was too late. And the Bible says in that day, men will pray to die. They will pray to the rock to fall on them. My dear friends, how tragic that will be. Why? They have not crowned him as king of glory in their hearts today. So in that day, they don't want to crown him as king of glory in the, of the universe. And so they run because they are frightening. They are frightening. Dear friends, the cry for the rocks and mountains to fall on them, the book of Thessalonians says, they are consumed with the brightness of his coming. The Christ who comes in glory cannot be endured by the unsaved. And as they fall, call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them, they are consumed with the brightness of his glory. And when Jesus comes the second time, there is no second chance. When Jesus comes the second time, there is no other opportunity. He has given us many opportunities. My dear friends, your opportunity is today. Your opportunity is tonight. Tonight is your opportunity. If he has given you so many opportunities, we won't need another one then. The Apostle Paul states it plainly in this way, that our eternal destiny is being settled by the choices that we make today. That is how they are settled. By the choices we make today. Dear friends, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2 says, Behold, no, when, no, tonight, this night, this Wednesday night, tonight, behold, no, is the accepted time. Behold, no, is the day of salvation. Dear friends, our eternal destiny is dependent upon our choices that we make today. My dear friends, I believe that we are living in the knife edge of time. In the knife edge of eternity. We are living in the days just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I believe that soon Jesus is going to stream down the corridors of the sky. So let's summarize the events that will take place at his return. The question is, what happens when Jesus comes? First, the Bible tells us there's going to be a great earthquake, a seismic upheaval. Because there will be a stupendous seismic upheaval. Mountains and islands will move out of their places. And a great earthquake will shake this planet. And then the Bible tells us that the dead will be raised. They're going to pop out their graves like corn kernels and hot oil. My dear friends, they are going to rise out of their grave. The righteous, the righteous. Dear friend, the Bible says, the righteous living, those who are not dead, but living when Christ comes, they are going to be changed in a nanosecond. They are going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye. And we are told that when Jesus Christ comes the second time, that immortality will be stored upon the righteous. And then it tells us that the wicked who are living at that time will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Dear friends, that is a clear summary of what we have looked at this evening so far. Revelation 6, 14 and 15 tells us that the wicked is going to call to the rock 
and the mountains to fall on them. When Jesus Christ comes, my dear friends, there is not going to be a second chance. It's no second chance. When Jesus comes, the wicked living are destroyed and those who are dead remain dead. Dear friends, this evening, dear friends, next what would happen? Bible tells us that the righteous huh, will be welcomed by Christ. The righteous ones will go to heaven to meet the Lord in the air. But some people say, but didn't you miss the text in the Bible that says that he's coming as a thief? Huh? And uh, there are two comings of Christ. One when he comes as a thief and another when he comes in glory. You know, one of our um, frequent uh, viewers has been asking a question about a secret rapture and I've asked you to hold off for a little while and now we can answer that question in detail. So the question is, what about the secret rapture? And my dear friend, let us know what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36 says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But he says, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, remember old couple in Toronto who went out to enjoy a night of theater? When they came back home, their barbecue grill was gone. Huh? If the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, what is he? He would have watched and not allow his house to be broken into. Now, the question is, is this text speaking about the manner of Christ's coming? Or is it speaking about the timing of Christ's coming? Let me ask the question again. Is this passage speaking about the manner of Christ's coming? Or is it speaking about the timing of Christ's coming? My dear friends, when the Bible talks about a thief, it is talking about the time when the thief comes and not the manner in which the thief comes. It is saying, when no man knows that hour. And if we knew that hour, when the thief would come, but no one knows. So the Bible says, my dear friend, is not speaking about the way in which Jesus Christ comes. He didn't say that Jesus is going to come in the manner of a thief. He says that Jesus is going to come with the timing of a thief, meaning that he's going to come unexpectedly. Dear friends, is that plain? Dear friends, no thief comes to break your house and bring the bullhorn and warns you and says, Hello, dear. I just want to let you know that I've been coming this evening to break into your house. My dear friends, no thief does that. My dear friends, he comes when we don't expect him and he comes quickly and rapidly. My dear friends, when the Bible says that Jesus comes as a thief, it means then that the world will not expect it either. He comes quickly. He comes unexpectedly. But every eye will see him. The Bible doesn't teach that he's going to come secretly as a thief. The Bible teaches that he's going to come unexpectedly like a thief. Notice verse 44. What verse 44 says? It says, therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming what? In a particular manner? No. He's coming at an hour that you did not expect. So my dear friends, when we read the context of the passage here, Jesus is not going to come as a thief in terms of manner. He's going to come as a thief in terms of hour, in terms of timing. That is why he says he's going to come in an hour that you do not expect. Listen to what 2 Peter 3 and verse 10 says. But the day of the Lord again will come how? Like a thief and the heavens will disappear with a what? With a roar. The elements will what? Will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Once again, Peter borrows the language from his master and says that Jesus is going to come like a thief 
but not silently, uh, not secretly, because here it says that he's going to come and the earth will be destroyed by fire and everything will be laid there. That tells me that is a dramatic coming. But here again, Peter is referring to the hour, the timing when Christ would come. When? When he comes as a thief. But somebody says, I thought the Bible says that there will be two in the field and one will be taken and another left. My dear friends, the second coming is going to be a surprise to the unprepared. A surprise to the unprepared. The prepared know that he's going to come, even though they do not know the timing. But the unprepared are surprised and are left. But what happens to the unprepared who are left? This is what the Bible tells us. It says, what about the expression, one taken and the other left? That's what man put in, my dear friend, says that Jesus goes and says, this man have interpreted this in their own way. But let's think plain with scripture. Luke 16, 17 and verse 36 says, that two men will be in the field, and the one will be taken, and the other will be left. Now, does the text say that one will be left, the one who is left will be left alive? Does it say that? No way does it say that the one that is left will be left alive. That's what man put in there. Luke 17 and verse 26 says, as it was, in the days of Noah. What was it like in the days of Noah? Were well, there two classes of people in the days of Noah? The answer is yes. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, there were two classes of people. What happened to the class that was left in the days of Noah? They were destroyed by the flood. And Jesus continued by saying, in Luke 17 and verse 28, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. What happened in the days of Lot? Was there one class that was taken out of the city? The answer is yes. Was Lot light? Was Lot white left the eye? Yes, she was, but she was turned into a pillar of a pillar of salt. My dear friends as it was in the days of Noah. And look, when Jesus Christ comes, there are going to be two classes of people. One will be saved, and one will be lost. One will be alive, ascending to meet the Lord, and the other, my dear friend, will meet with disaster. My dear friends, as the days of Lot, one class left out of the city safe, and one class will be left and destroyed. If and so when the Bible describes the second coming of Christ, one of the greatest exceptions is that some will be left on earth and they're going to have a second chance. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Some teach that people are going to be miraculously raptured. The plane will be flying and the pilot will disappear. The Bible doesn't teach that. Not one place the Bible teaches that. And leave the other behind to go to the tribulation. The devil has sold that lie to deceive people in order to put off their salvation. They think that I can put off my salvation for later on during the tribulation, I can get serious with God. But ladies and gentlemen, according to the authority of God's word and the book of Revelation, according to the teachings of Jesus Christ himself, there is no second opportunity. The time to get serious about your salvation is now. The time to get serious about your salvation is tonight. Tonight. Dear friends, Christ's coming will be a joyous event. Don't put it off for some future date. Don't delay to some more convenient time. Don't miss out on the most magnificent event of the earth. When Christ comes, 
it will certainly be a joyous event. It will be the happiest event in the history of the ages. John 14 and verse 2 says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus comes, bursting down the corridors of the sky. Here is a young family. Imagine, they are praying and they hear a thunder on the outside. And they get up and they look outside and what they thought was thunder was actually the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they are called up to meet Jesus in the air. Instantly, they meet him. Here's a family. They have laid their baby in the grave. But now, there is a rumbling and the lightning flashes and lights up the sky. And they look up and they see Jesus. Jesus is coming in the clouds of glory as the lightning flashes from the east and even to the west. The angel comes and he comes and the dead are resurrected. And mama holds the baby in her arms once again. And today, together, they are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Dear friends, do you have a sense that if Jesus comes very soon, that you will be ready for his second coming? Dear friends, on the screen, on the screen, I have a picture here of my graduation from Caribbean Union College in Trinidad in 1994. And there, congratulating me in this picture, was my good friend from St. Tuta, Pastor Marius Scott. Marius Scott, I graduated maybe two years before him, but we met up once again in New York. Both of us are struggling, unemployed young creatures. And oftentimes, almost every Friday evening, Mario would call me. Say, Ray, how was your week? How are things going? When I was moving, Mario would be the first to show up. And he would help me. Most of the time, he would be doing a lot of talking. And I have to remind him, Mario, we here to work, not talk. But we were that kind of a good friend. You know, dear friends, Mario had emphysema. And the doctor told him that if he didn't get a long transplant, the prospect didn't look so well. So I could never forget that evening when Mario called me on the telephone, he says, Ray, the doctor told me that I have to now go on oxygen. Time is running out for me. And so I remember I went to Brooklyn and I preached by one of the churches, my good friend, that we met together and we took a picture together. Mario was walking around, just 42 years old, walking around with his oxygen tank. I remember that Saturday night, Mario called me, called me on the phone. He says, well, I'm going back into the hospital and it doesn't look good. I don't think I'll be coming out. I want you to preach my funeral. I said, Mario, you're joking. Yeah. So you know that we are praying for you and so forth. And dear friend, we spoke. Eventually, Mary says, you know, um, the, 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 my, my phone, the, 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 the credit on my phone is running out. So I, I have to, you know, I have to hang up at this time. Dear friend, that credit on his phone was a symbol of his own life. Mary was in that hospital in a coma, and in medically induced coma. Because his lungs were shut down. And he indeed, two weeks after that conversation, he passed away. My dear friends, the commitment that I've made to him, that I was going to preach his funeral, I did in Brooklyn. And my dear friends, it was about the hardest funeral that I had to preach. Seeing that here is someone that we we, we, we were in school together at. We are looking to the prospect of going to the ministry. And every Friday night, Mario would call me. I mean, if, if I had one friend, it would have been Mario. Dear friends, Mario had told me before he died. He says, Ray, I'm not worried. Because I know as I go into the hospital, that when I wake up, the first face I'm going to see is the face of Jesus. And even though I cannot shout hallelujah now because my lungs are not working the way they should, 
The first thing I'm going to say when I see Jesus is that I'm going to say hallelujah. My dear friend, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the second coming of Jesus because I'm looking forward to the time when I can talk with Mario once again. Thank God that Mario loved Jesus. Thank God that he believed in Jesus. My dear friend, Mario is taken to the little nut. Someday, my dear friends, is going to burst the clouds of glory. Dear friends, I remember when I was 11 years old, going to meetings that are similar like this. I remember my, my sister that followed me. Could remember that Wednesday evening, as we, uh, Wednesday evening night to night, as we were going home, and she saw the pictures of this on the screen, and she saw the, the coming of Jesus Christ, and she was asking my mother all kind of questions about heaven. What is heaven like, mommy? What would this stuff like? What is this like? I remember that Friday night, Thursday, she was sick, not feeling well, just had a slight fever. That was it. Just a slight fever, Patrice. My sister that followed me, just a slight fever. And the Friday night, we went out again to the evangelistic meetings. By the time we came back home, my elder sister that had stayed home with her came and says, Mommy, 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 Patrice is not breathing and her jaw is locked. My dear friend, in those days, 1976, in those days, the, the, the number of vehicles owner in the village were like, you can count on one finger. But we need, there was no 911 to call. There was no telephone in the house, my dear friends. And here we went and could get the closest neighbor that had a vehicle. By the time she got to the doctor, the doctor said that she had come too late. Dear friends, she laid my eight-year-old sister Patsy in the grave, but she had had a chance to hear about Jesus. She was going to those meetings. Wednesday night, she was asking about heaven. My dear friends, by Friday, she had taken a nap. Dear friend, but I'm looking forward to the time when I can see my sister once again. I'm looking forward to that time when I can see her again. Dear friend, she's in a grave simply because she didn't have a tetanus vaccine. Then my dear friend, Here, my dear friends, is my grandmother who taught me about Jesus. My mother left me with my grandmother when I was about maybe a year and a half, too early for me to remember. Went off to St. Croix, Virgin Islands to make life better. My dear friends, I grew up with this old lady. She took me to church, went to church with her. This grandmother had elephant titles. My friends in my class used to laugh after her because she had to have special shoes built, made for her because she had elephant titles. But she took me to church, and in that church, I learned about Jesus. I learned about the Jesus who loved me and died for me and saved me. I thank God for grandmothers who are still willing to train their grandchildren to have them walk in the way. My dear friends, I still remember that Sunday afternoon on May 11, a day. One day after my, uh, 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 one day after her birthday, May 11, 1981, that was Mother's Day, and my grandmother fell asleep at 81 years of age. That, remember that the undertakers came for her and took her away. I used to sleep right next to her on the bed. I just changed the sheet, and I was fast asleep where she had died that same day. My dear friends, I'm looking forward to the time when I will be able to see my grandmother again because I knew that she loved Jesus. My dear friends, I don't know about you. I don't know about your story, but I know there is no home without its empty chair. There is no home, my dear friends, that death hasn't touched because we are living in a sinful world. But my dear friends, death, death will not have the victory because my dear friends, I want to let you know, soon Jesus Christ is going to descend as your side. Soon, my dear friend, Jesus Christ will descend and my dear friend, all of our loved ones will be called out of the grave. I'm longing for that day. I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus Christ will come, my dear friend. I'm fed up of this world I don't know about you. Fed up about hearing the Delta and the, and the Gamma. But fed up, my dear friends, of talking about the economic fallout of this and fed up of hearing about wars and rumors of wars. My dear friend, I'm fed up of this world. I'm looking forward for a world to come. I'm looking forward to that day. My dear friend, the question is tonight, is there anything that will keep you from being ready for the coming of Christ? Is there anything? Is there anything that will prevent you? My dear friends, there is only one thing. 
that can satisfy today and that can satisfy forever. Only one thing. And so would you like to say to Jesus tonight, oh Jesus, I believe that you're coming in the clouds of glory and I want to be ready. I want to be ready. Dear friends, last year, one of my good friends, good friends, close friends from high school, got the news that she had passed from COVID-19. And that one struck me hard. Struck me hard. I've lost two classmates from this pandemic. Dear friends, if she loved Jesus and she had committed her life to Jesus, dear friends, I know that time is going to come when we'll meet each other again. We will be able to walk on the streets of gold and we'll be able to see Jesus. My dear friends, tonight, to miss heaven is to miss everything. To miss heaven is to miss everything. Dear friends, I've had enough hell in this world to go to another one. I'm looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. I'm looking forward to see the eyes of my Savior. Face to face shall I behold him. Far beyond the starry sky, the sun right to face. Face to face shall I behold him. And I shall see him by and by. Dear friend, my heart warms within me when I think about the second coming of Jesus. My dear friends, my, 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 my body tingles. When I think about the second coming of Jesus. Because I know that just one look at my Savior. It would be worth it all. Just to get one look at my Savior. Oh, I love him so much. I love to talk about him. I love to live for him. My dear friends, I get excited about him. Sometimes I'm studying this book, my dear friends, and I'm reading about Jesus, and I cannot sit down. I have to get up and walk around like a crazy man. My dear friends, I love Jesus. I'm looking forward to seeing him. What about you? What about you? Why not go to the website, sbpsem.com. Click on that decision button. Let me know. Let God know most important. You want to be ready when Jesus comes. Dear friends, the time is late. But the best time, the best time is now. Now is the accepted time. Now is the accepted time. Why not pray? Pray with me tonight. Oh, loving Heavenly Father and our God. We're looking forward to your second return. To your second coming. We are tired of this old world. We have things get worn out, including our bodies. We want to live in a place where we don't have to do any repairs. We want to live in a place where there's no more sickness, no more illness, nothing to annoy. We just want to live in joy, joy forevermore. Give us your grace. Give us your mercy. Help, oh Lord, that thousands tonight may make that decision that they are going to be ready for when you shall return soon. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.